first timer. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Alyssa Hermanson. I'm the assistant director for Love Inc. And we are here tonight for our first um, in the series of learning conversation shorts. So in this series, uh, each month we'll be um, going off of one question that's been submitted by an individual with an intellectual disability, a family member, a community member, um, and we will have an expert here to talk on that question, um, but we will also gather feedback from one another. Um, so before we get into tonight's question, um, if we could just do introductions, so um, just quick who you are and if you're here as a parent or um, in, for yourself, um, if you'd like to share that. Rachel, would you like to start? I say I can go next and just go down there. Sure. Um, I'm Rachel Tricosis and I'm an adult on the autism spectrum and I'm here for myself. Lauren? Um, I'm Lauren Detmer. I'm the community organizer for Love, Inc. Um, I'm one of the staff members helping and assisting through this meeting. Um, I also am learning on behalf of everything that is presented. Awesome. Jeannie? Hi, I'm Jeannie Sturkin. I'm a parent of a, a young woman uh, with intellectual and um, disability and um, I always love to learn new things. Wonderful. Jack? Hi, I'm Jack. Um, I'm a young adult on the spectrum, on the autism spectrum. Um, I'm here mainly because I know a lot of people that struggle with this particular issue, and I'm hoping to learn some stuff to help them. That's great. Anne? Hi, I'm Ann Karch, and I'm the parent of a young woman with IDD, and um, we've been wondering the answer to this question for quite a while. <laughs> great. And Megan? I'm Megan Tejan. I'm an attorney with the law firm Johnson Tejan in Fitchburg. Um, our practice specializes in um, comprehensive estate planning and long-term planning for um, families and for individuals with special needs. Awesome. Thank you. So Rachel, would you like to give us our question for tonight? Sure. So the question tonight is how do I manage my bank account so that I do not go over my over the asset limit and lose my medical benefits. Okay. So uh, for individuals who this pertains to you or to a family member, um, if we could just share your thoughts um, on this question, uh, maybe what you have been doing um, to stay within those limits or uh, maybe the question that's looming over you of, is this okay, um, this piece of it, or you know, um, any feedback that you wanna give um, on the question, um, if someone is interested in starting out that conversation. Well, every month we just have to watch our balance in the um, bank. And um, sometimes the balance gets a little bit close and you end up spending down a little bit on some item that you've been in the back of your mind thinking that would be useful. We did set up a WISPAC account so that we, um, Catherine, can, our daughter can put her funds into that um, when that becomes an issue. So um, that's one mechanism that we've used. Mm -hmm. And how did you learn about WISPACT as an option um, that's uh, separate from just spending down? Well, um, I think that uh, I've heard of a couple different places, but Fearless Futures Workshop, um, where Megan Teagan presented, um, I learned a little sampling of it, and then uh, we um, set up an appointment to um, learn more. So it's very easy to implement and um, very nice process there, there and I gotta say WISPAC has been very responsive to any questions we've had so it's been a good move for us good and so for you it's just a matter of checking by the end of the month is it something that you do maybe five days prior to the next month or what's the what's the process yeah I have it actually on my calendar um, check 
the balance and things like that. But there's always that potential if um, the account is nearing our asset limit, we have to be careful because um, occasionally there'll be a bonus from work or if a little extra work is put in time. So just little things that you have to be aware of. Yeah, good, thank you. Does anyone else wanna share their experience with that? I guess for me, kind of like Jeannie, except also um, my dad has created a special needs trust for me. And so if I ever get close to my limit, I transfer some money towards that. That's basically all I really do in terms of mm -hmm. not getting to the $2,000 asset limit for me. Mm -hmm. Okay. And for that special needs trust, is that something where... Um, do you know, Rachel, if it's like a first party or a third party where um, it's under your name or so else's? It is not under mine. I mean, it is under my name, but I'm not allowed to touch it until my both of my parents pass away. And then it goes down to my stepmom and then my brother will be in charge. So they put like $500 in every month and then or whenever need be. And then when it comes to that point, it'll cover all the medical bills and everything that I'm financially not able to cover yeah. from my understanding. But otherwise, I don't really know. Yeah. Well, one thing, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, is that my, it's important to realize is that individuals cannot directly contribute to an SNT, the, the individual with disability. It's got to be like a parent or somebody else who contributes to it. And that's the one, one thing I've heard, not just from Rachel Storm, but other people too have said this to me as a drawback on that. I think a lot of people have trouble with that I know of is like, you know, with the assets, you can't even like, for example, save up for a security deposit for an apartment. That's often more than $2,000 and it's really frustrating, you know. It's, yeah. it so it's about figuring out um, how can you um, safely and legally save money when you have that asset limit. Yes. Um, so being able to explore those options, yeah. Yes. Yeah, Rachel, had you heard about, um, so like Jeannie talked about WizPact or um, like an ABLE account? I mean, a little bit, but I don't really know about it. And then it yeah. also comes into play with, I get um, medic, I get forward health through, you know, a private one. And then I also have state insurance for my, from my job. So it's just the biggest part is losing my um, forward health insurance. So that's where the asset limit comes into play for me. Okay. Yeah. And is saving um, separate from putting money into that special needs trust something that you're interested in? Yeah, I would like to know, learn more because I don't really, I mean, I like the SNT trust, but if something happens, no one in my family can remember that information or the bank. I want to know how and what resources I can do just so I don't run into any legal or financial issues in the future. Well, another example, like, you know, for example, for a while during COVID when, you know, you're not able to work and suddenly, well, you can't save money for this ahead of time. And now you're without work and because it's voluntary, you can't get unemployment. So it's sure. like, you know, there's not a, a, we haven't found a good workaround to be able to have a rainy day fund for something like that. Yeah, that's huge. And did you want to share anything? Um, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> um, I guess it really hasn't come up for us because we spend all of Rachel's money on food. <laughs> so we were more in danger of running out at the end of the um, thing and we don't charge her rent. So she didn't have to pay rent. So um we just don't end up in that situation. Mm -hmm. And we have a special needs trust set up for her. Mm -hmm. But um, eventually when we're gone, someone, someone will have to manage her, her bank account and she will have to pay at least her taxes mm -hmm. um, on, the, on the property taxes. So we kind of need to know this. Yeah, yeah. And Jack, were there any other um, examples that you've heard from your peers of, you know, situations that they've been in because well, of that asset limit? Actually, yes. I had another friend recently that is works for um, 
an employer that's essential and was given hazard pay. And because of the hazard pay, it put him over his income limit. And he had to frantically actually cut his hours at work, which his employer didn't want to do just because he couldn't make the amount of money they were charging. They could not decline the hazard pay. Oof. Well, it's the same sort of thing as like Jeannie was mentioning about getting a bonus. This is a perfect example of this is what happened. And Right. Yep. Yeah, when you're not expecting that. The telephone, so he has to, they have to be open. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Anything else before we let uh, Megan talk on this? She's probably dying to answer all the things we've just said. <laughs> <laughs> Waiting so patiently. <laughs> all right, Megan, we will let you go at it. <laughs> all right, awesome. Um, First of all, Rachel, thanks so much for that question because it's it's such an important question. I think um, a person like me, it's kind of like my entire career has been based on that question. Um, when I first started working, I worked for um, uh, the legal support team for the, for the ADRCs, and so that this was a, a very big issue for the fo folks that um, receive support from the ADRCs. Um, I next worked with the WISPAC program, so I've got some um, experience with them specifically, so I'm happy to, to kind of talk about how, how they operate. Um, but the question that you bring up is so vitally important, and the, the good news is that there are good options out there for savings for you individually, for your own savings. So you kind of touched on a, a, some of the issues that that come up very frequently when I'm talking with, with individuals or with families, and that is both a family doing savings. So like when you talk to kind of about maybe your family setting aside some money for you, um, that's one component of, of long-term planning that your family's doing. But, and, and that's where, where Alyssa kind of talked about this, this concept of third party. And that's really important because there are um, savings vehicles that have this word around them called third party. I'll kind of set that aside because that's more of maybe an estate planning um, talk that I do with, with families. But for your specific issue, um, you have a couple options. So number one, you're doing absolutely the right thing and that you're conscious of the asset limit of your benefits. And that's so important. Um, and as you probably know, but I'll just kind of remind everybody, um, for benefits that are means tested, meaning that there is an asset limit to them, um, it's really important to understand income and assets. And so income is the money that comes in each month. And so either through working or through social security, either SSDI or SSI or a com combination of both, combination of all three with working, that flows in each month. And the month in which it comes in, it's considered income. By the next month, when we carry it over, it's considered an asset. So you, you, you can see kind of you have this flow in and you've got to just be conscious that by the time you turn the calendar the next month, your asset limit is below your program maximum. And it just varies by, by whatever um, benefits you're receiving. Um, so when you get to that point and you're thinking about what are my options, your options are, as Jeannie had mentioned, number one, you can what they call spend down. And so that is where you just basically would go buy something. Um, and what could you buy? Well, you'd want to be mindful to not buy something that would otherwise be countable for your assets, but that's not usually a, an issue. What I mean by that is like if you went out and bought a car but it's your second car because your one, your first car doesn't count, but your second car would. So, you know, random example, but you just want to be a little conscious of what you do buy. Um, so you want to, that's, that's one option. Um, but as you mentioned, and as, as Jack mentioned too, you don't want to necessarily spend it just to spend it. You maybe want to save it for the rainy day for a down, for a security deposit, like you mentioned, Jack. Um, maybe travel, all the good reasons that we want to save. Um, and so your two good options for a savings vehicle for you yourself is a first party special needs trust um, or an ABLE account. 
And so the first party special needs trusts I'll talk about just really briefly, um, we threw around the word WISPACT. Um, WISPACT is a nonprofit organization that administers or they run um, these first party special needs trusts. So when someone says they have a WISPACT trust, it's really another way of saying they have a special needs trust. And so that is a, a great, great option for when your income gets a little bit too, or your savings gets a little bit too close to that limit and you want to transition that savings from your savings account to a vehicle that won't count towards that asset limit, that's where WISC Pact can be helpful. And so that's kind of the critical piece of all this. Why am I talking about WISC Pact? Why am I talking about ABLE? Because the way those vehicles are structured, those savings vehicles are structured, they don't count towards that $2,000. So that's the really critical point. You could put a million dollars in the WISPAC trust and it won't count towards your $2,000 asset limit. It just won't. It's the way that the, the um, account is structured legally. Um, and you can kind of feel it's, it's, it's grassroots organizations like this and like the parents groups that we're talking about that is the reason we have these vehicles because they got together 20 or so years ago and said, I don't like that I have to spend every penny that my child receives or that the child themselves says, I don't like that I have to keep spending. Why can't I save? And that's kind of the, the legislative history of why we have these accounts. Um, so WISPACT is an awesome option. It's very easy to set up. Um, you do have to go through an attorney um, to do it, but they have a great program where they will actually pay the attorney's fee to set up the account. So even if you wanna just set aside um, a few hundred dollars a month, it's something that you can do. Um, to start the WISPAC trust, you need to have a minimum of $1,000. Um, and that is their, their minimum they require is $750 plus a $250 um, setup fee, but they reimburse you that setup fee. So at the end of the day, when you set up a, a new trust, you'd have a um, $1,000 in the account that then you could draw on if you had to pay for the down payment, pay for books or whatever you might need in the future. And then you have that vehicle there, the account that you can always write a check every month for $50, $100, whatever you might want to do, write the check to WISPAC before the month is up. It's now moved from your bank account, which is countable to that asset limit, to your WISPAC special needs trust, which isn't countable. Does anyone have questions on that before I just kind of mention ABLE as another option? Are there any restrictions as to what that WISPAC money can be used for? Yeah, that's a really, really good point, Jack, because that's, that's kind of where the difference with ABLE comes in. Um, there are restrictions. And so WISPAC is a trustee and they're going to assess when you ask them to pay for something. Number one is what you're asking for, for your sole benefit only. That's one of the things they'll ask. Um, and this is because of the benefit program rules. So you couldn't use funds in a WISPAC trust to take six buddies out to eat. You could potentially pay for your own dinner, but you can't pay for those six other people. Um, so they'll, that's one thing they'll do. If you're on SSI, they ha may have some restrictions on paying for food or shelter expenses, um, but that's very unique to the individual. And so um, I'm, I'm happy to kind of elaborate on that issue, but that's one thing where they would kind of work with you about maybe there's a better option for, for um, how to pay for those expenses. Um, but those are their two big restrictions. But they also will assess in some ways whether the distribution is quote unquote in their terms prudent. Um, they're not judgmental, I'll say that. Like it's not a lifestyle type judgment that they would do, but where they would be cautious is if someone were spending excessively on things that, that was depleting their trust very rapidly and maybe they'd wanna encourage them to talk to a financial counselor or something like that. But to that end, it's not the same as going to your bank account 
and taking money out and buying whatever you want. You do have to go through them to get approval, but it's not awful either. It's pretty, it's, it works pretty well. Any other questions on WISPACT as a first party trust option? So you okay. said there are restrictions on food or shelter. So does that mean that you can't like use it to like pay rent if you don't get income one month or something? Well, and this is where it just, if you're on SSI, um, SSI has a rule that if any third party pays for food or shelter like rent um, or utility expenses or food, um, SSI will take a, a reduction in your monthly benefit up to, but they cap it out. So if the federal benefit rate is, is around $783 this month um, or this year, they'll, and you had someone paid a thousand dollars for your rent and you're on SSI, SSI will, will say, okay, one third of your SSI is not gonna be paid to you this month, uh, the, the following month because you received shelter payments from a third party source. So it's it's the strangest rule you've ever seen. The the rationale, I always like to understand the rationale for these rules because it makes it, it then kind of makes more sense. This is why they do it. Um, SSI is a, a federal grant. It's not, so SSDI is a little bit of a different benefit. It's an entitlement benefit, meaning that you people have paid into the system and then they receive income back or their parent had and they receive income. SSI is a grant. And so what the federal government has said is we're, we're gonna give you this grant each month to pay for your most, most basic human needs, food and shelter expenses. And so if some other source is gonna give you that, I guess you don't need all that we're giving you. So we're gonna take some of it back, but we're not gonna be so terrible that we take it all. We're gonna cap it at a third. So in some people's situation, it's okay. They're, they're willing to forego a third of their SSI to maybe have a third party, like a trust or a parent pay their rent um, to, to live in a better situation. Um, but that's just the rule. So they will run through some analysis. That's that's that goofy rule. It's called in-kind support and maintenance. Any other questions on that weird rule? And so that's, trust? that's not, it's not so much a restriction on withdrawing it from WISPAC as it is the restriction on what SSI allows you to do on that end. Exactly. And, and that's that's kind of the interplay. So WISPAC will take, they will follow Social Security's regulations. Um, and what they'll do is they'll make you aware that you have to report that you received what they'd call in-kind support and maintenance. You received payments for shelter expenses in this example. So you have to report it to Social Security. So WISPAC might not, they might say, okay, we'll pay your rent because we know that's better for you. Um, but you have to report it and you have to be aware of the fact that your next month's SSI is going to be either whatever the amount we paid for capped out at a third of the of the federal benefit rate the next month so they could pay for it they just make you go through a little bit of more hoops because you have to do a disclosure to social security but that's just ssi and not everybody's on ssi it's it's um it's not medicaid it's not ssdi it's just specifically to ssi or supplemental security income Um, but ABLE, so I'll, I'll talk briefly about ABLE, um, is a little, is new, it's newer, it's, it's about five years old now, um, it stands for Achieving a Better Life Experience, and this was the law that was passed, um, it is in some ways similar to a first party special needs trust, like a WISPAC trust, and in some ways it's different, um, how is it similar, it's similar in that it is a savings vehicle that is an option for some folks, um, and the money that you save in it doesn't count towards your asset limit. So you can put money into that account too. How it's different from a, a WISPAC trust is number one, you're in charge. So the person who is the, um, the beneficiary, the owner of the account is in charge. You don't have to go through like a WISPAC to approve distributions. Um, 
it's it's not available to everybody. So it's only available right now to individuals who can verify um, that they have a, a, a disability prior to age 26. Um, you don't have to have a formal determination. You can provide other certifications from uh, professionals to, to verify that fact. Um, there's talk that they may change that in the future, but right now that's the world we live in is that it's only available for those folks um, prior to age 26. Um, there's limits on how much you can put in to the account. Um, you can only put in right now um, 15,000 per year. If you're working though, you can put in more. You can put in about 12,000 more dollars than the 15,000 per year. So that's a pretty hefty amount that you can put into that account per year, um, especially if you're working and, and one of your objectives is to save your working savings. Um, it is what you can spend the money on out of the ABLE account are things called qualified disability expenses. Um, and there's a whole list that you can, you can look up what that is. Um, it's virtually everything. So I'd feel very confident arguing almost anything is a qualified disability expense. Um, but ABLE is a really great tool. Um, there's, we don't have one here in Wisconsin and different states have different programs. Um, unfortunately, we're one of the seven states that does not have our own ABLE program. We may form a consortium with other states soon, but nothing on the immediate horizon. Um, there's two resources I'd, I'd share with you to look into this if you want to look at ABLE. Um, one is called the ABLE National Resource Center. And that is, if you just Google it, you'll find the website. Um, or I'm happy to share it with Alyssa and she can forward it to the group. Um, it's a really great just kind of um, survey resource about ABLE programs across the country. Um, I would say most folks that I work with are using Ohio's program, which is called STABLE. So ABLE with an S before it, STABLE. Um, I've helped a family set one up and it was so easy. It, it took me and the gentleman 10 minutes, it's like setting up, um, you know, an Amazon account or bank account or something like that. Um, the minimum I think was stable was like 50 bucks. Um, they do charge maintenance fees. Um, so that's something to look into. Um, but there's um, some advantages in that. I, I believe that the, the assets in there, there's some tax advantages too. So um, the nice thing about ABLE is that there is no, that, that thing, goofy thing I just talked about, shelter expenses um, for SSI, that's not an issue for an ABLE account. So if, for example, someone, you know, if a parent wanted to pay rent for someone that was on SSI, instead of the parent paying the rent, the parent might put the money into the ABLE account and the ABLE account pays the rent and then we don't have that issue. So there's some, you know, goofy planning things we can do if that becomes an issue for a family. But um, the main differences I think, or the main takeaways I'd, I'd give to, to you, Rachel, is that um, good options for long-term savings for you, for your income, are probably gonna be a, a first party WISPAC trust um, or an ABLE account. Those are kind of the two options. I'm happy to answer questions anybody has about those two. One question that came up for me um, was uh, just confirming whether or not anyone can put money into the ABLE account um, for that individual. So what would that process look like? Do they have to have uh, like the account username and password to put money into there or how does that work? That's a great question. I'm not sure about the mechanics of how they'd actually make a deposit. I know for the one family I helped, I think they did a um, like a bank draw okay. right, right through there. Um, but to answer your question, Alyssa, yeah, anyone can put money into an ABLE account. Okay. Um, for, the, for the parents out there that are supporting a child um, on, on benefits, I might have a, a conversation with them about the strategy of maybe putting too much into an ABLE account. Um, an ABLE account is subject to a Medicaid payback um, so it's not an appropriate estate planning vehicle, but for immediate use, 
um, or some short term savings just to have a little bit of a cushion there, it's a great tool. Mm -hmm. Are there any restrictions as to what the person can use money from the ABLE account for? You know, you've got to meet, this is where we're a little bit of the Wild West. So um, because it's only five years old, and what's kind of unique about ABLE too is that it's, it's um, an IRS rule. And most of everything we deal with is social security. So we're used to the social security administration and how they, you know, wrap our knuckles when we do something bad or send us mean letters. We aren't sure what the IRS is gonna do. So that's kind of one thing. Um, the opinion is that they're gonna start kind of scrutinizing ABLE accounts a little bit greater in the future. Um, but to your exact question, Jack, you just, as long as you're, you're spending it on again, what they'd call a qualified disability expense of which if you look on the ABLE National Resource Center's page, um, they'll show you examples. But again, it's almost everything you could imagine. It's shelter expenses, education expenses, entertainment expenses, healthcare, um, really almost anything you could, you could imagine. Um, Megan, I remember one of them allows you to pay for a travel companion um, if you, but one doesn't. And is it the ABLE account that would allow that and WISPAC would not? Or am I confusing that? You know, I, again, I, I, I like to argue, so I would argue both would. Um, WISPAC might make you jump through a one or two hoops, but they're kind of good hoops. So the hoops they'd make you jump through are just to verify the necessity of the um, travel companion. And that's be for that sole benefit issue. So again, you know, these trusts have to follow the sole benefit rule. So they want to just have something in your file to show you needed that person there to travel with you, not that you just brought, you paid for someone else's trip. They're just trying to prepare that argument. I've, I've also never really had to make that argument to Social Security, so it's, it's probably a little bit overkill, but that's the WISPAC would make you verify that before they pay for it, but then they'd gladly pay for it because it's an extremely valid expense. And um, is that um, uh, accounts I've forgotten, are parents able to add to the WISPAC account because it's a first party account? Um, it's the individuals is a parent able to put into that as mm -hmm. they are with an able account. Yeah, they sure can. And, and so there's no restriction on who can put money into an able account or who can put money into a first party special needs trust. But again, that same issue of right. money, the, it's, it's a subject to a payback. So for strategy purposes, for really um, long term savings, the parent probably wants to either keep it in their own pocket and have a good estate plan with a third party special needs trust. Or if they already have a third party special needs trust set, set up to put it in there. Um, but if it's just a sure. little bit, it's, it's not worth pulling right. your hair out, but you understand that, yeah. that kind of danger. You just don't want to have too much subject to that payback. What is that payback? Do they have to pay it back with, you know, time of death or something? You got it. Yeah, exactly. So the 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 rub with these accounts, they're exempt during the person's life, but when the person passes away, um, Medicaid will ask for reimbursement for the services they provided during that person's life, which is is okay when it's it's your own money and your savings and you're you're benefiting from the the Medicaid benefit. Um, but then if, if it we're thinking about kind of a bigger estate plan, we want to limit as many creditors as we can from, um, from an inheritance. That's, that's kind of the different concept. And so that to that point, Rachel, um, you know, I think sometimes it, families will have a trust and they'll, the parents will set it up. You'll just want to be really careful that if, if your parents had, or other family members had set up a trust for you, um, if it's a third party trust, and third party just means anybody but yourself. So if they set that up and that's maybe part of their estate plan, you, you would just wanna be careful that your money doesn't go in there um, because it, it just, we wanna keep a really clear distinction between 
your money, which is considered first party money and their money, which is considered third party money. Because if they intermingle, um, that's where that creditor, the, the state's claim can come in. So it's just something I always want families to be aware of to not kind of mix mix your money with their money. And is that something where it would be beneficial for Rachel and her family to be talking with someone to make sure that um, the money is in the appropriate type of trust or what would a, a checking yeah. point be for that? For sure. I, you know, it's, it's, it's always a good, a good idea to check in on, on these types of trusts every five to 10 years. Um, the social security regulations change so frequently that we find ourselves having to change our trusts just as fast. Um, so that's a great point is, um, and I, I love when the whole family's involved because everybody kind of understands where, what's, where everything goes. So, um, you know, checking in, if, if there was a trust established in the past um, to check in now that you're starting to save more, um, Rachel, that's probably not a bad idea for you and the whole family to kind of just do a check-in to, to make sure it's all um, up to date. I guess I did have another side question to that. Um, do you know normally when SSI audits people to like see how much money they have in their account? I wish I did. Um, the The only thing I'll say is, um, our old saying when I was working with the ADRC is, is like, is that SSI is like your mother, like they're, they might not know right away, but they're going to figure it out at some point. So um, they, they do it frequently, more frequently than I would have expected them to. Um, so it's, it's definitely, it's, it's an important thing to keep on top of that asset limit. Um, and they'll pick up the randomest things too. And it could be even from years in the past. So there is now um, Medicaid and even in the past few years has um, expanded their ability to do account checks themselves. So it used to be that you they'd ask, hey, show us all your bank statements so we can verify. Um, now they can actually kind of pro, it's a little, little scary, but they can kind of proactively go out there and sweep for accounts and see what everyone's, see what limits are, you know, it's kind of a look of the draws to who they, you know, quote unquote catch, um, but it's theirs and they're, they're watching. So it's, it's really important to kind of stay within their, their guidelines. But to, to that point, if, if someone ever were over asset um, for SSI purposes, what does that mean? It means that they may have a period of time where they are um, would have been ineligible. Um, what SSI typically does then is they would deduct 10% uh, from future benefits. They wouldn't just cut you off totally or say hand us over a check. You could hand over a check and pay them back, um, but they would just say your, your penalty period is three months. Um, and so we'll deduct 10% for however many months it takes to pay that back. That's good to know. Um, for the uh, ABLE account, the stable out of um, Ohio, people um, get like a debit card type of situation. So that makes it really nice for individual um, to be able to use um, versus WISPACT. I think you either have to show that it has to be paid or, but they will do like recurring expenses. I understand um, mm -hmm. um, cable TV or what, <laughs> I don't know, whatever. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. So that's how most folks would use WISPACT is you'd, you'd set up, if you had enough savings in there, you'd maybe say, WISPAC will pay my phone bill every month or they'll pay this other bill that's recurring and that's a real easy thing off the top that they can pay. Um, ABLE does have, it's called a TrueLink card. And so it's a, it's a debit card where you could go on the computer and say, okay, I have $3,000 in my ABLE account. I wanna put $200 on my TrueLink card and then you can take your TrueLink card to the store and, and use it like a debit card. Um, WISPACT has the capability to also use TrueLink. That's kind of a new 
development. Um, it used to be that we couldn't use a, 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 a preloaded debit card with a special needs trust because holding the debit card was like holding cash. And that's why it was so difficult, but social security changed their regulations because people advocated for it. So that was a good thing. Now it's not as long as WISPAC owns the TrueLink card. So we're my kind of community of attorneys, we're working to try to understand you can do it WISPAC. Are you willing to do it? Are you willing to own these cards? Cause it's so much better than than what they use. What they used to do is you'd have to go, if you wanted to buy something at Target, for example, if you didn't have a credit card, um, you'd go there, you'd pick out the things you wanted to buy. You'd get something called a training receipt. And that just showed what you wanted to buy. You'd show that to Wispact. Wispact would approve it. Wispact would send you a check for the amount it's worth written out to Target. And then you had to go rebuy those things and go to the checkout counter and present this check to Wispact or to, to Target that says, to target for this amount. So it was a big mess. It just was so inefficient and it was so frustrating. So I think TrueLink is the solution to that, um, but I'm not sure if they're using it yet. But to your point, Jeannie, yeah, exactly. That's another example that able to buy things like what well, I'd say point of sale, like Target, Kohl's, Walmart, um, able's a lot easier. Any other questions before we wrap up tonight? Do you feel like this um, was enough information, Rachel, to answer the question? <laughs> She's like, yes. yes good. And if you need any of those links, um, I'm sure you can let Alyssa know and she can. I'll, yeah, I'll, I've been taking them. notes and I'll, I'll make sure to, um, to share that out with links um, to what's been discussed. Um, so thank you so much, Megan, for being here. Thank You're you, Rachel, welcome. for asking this question. Uh, you are not alone in wondering that. And um, like Megan shared, it's great that you're conscious of it and you're thinking about that um, each month because it is really important. Um, so our next topic will be mental health. Um, so if anyone is interested in submitting a question for um, next month, uh, that uh, pertains to mental health, you could send that to myself or Lauren. Um, a tentative date with, for that would be Tuesday, January 12th at seven o'clock again, um, but we'll put that out in our weekly newsletter soon. Um, and I just wanted to make mention as well that um, something that we'll be doing next week with Love Inc. is having a Q&A with a retired WIN nurse, uh, Marcia Stickle. She'll be talking about uh, the vaccine and answering questions about, um, you know, some things that are maybe top of mind for folks um, around that topic. So that will be next week, Tuesday from 1.30 to 2.30. Um, and that will be in this week's newsletter where you can request the link for that. It will be a Zoom meeting and then we'll also be recording that to put on the YouTube channel. So that is all for tonight. Thank you all for being here. Um, Megan, of course, your time is always so valuable. <laughs> we really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, we'll hope to see you all next month.